Greetings and welcome to Hangouts with Hive. Today's topic is caring for women who engage in sex for money, goods, or survival. My name is Yamini Oseguera Bhatnagar, and I'm the powerhouse coordinator at Hive, which is a hub for positive reproductive and sexual health. It's the 28th of September in 2018, and I'm broadcasting live from San Francisco. A little bit about Hive. Since 1989, Hive, which was formerly the Bay Area Perinatal AIDS Center, has provided preconception and prenatal care to women and couples affected by HIV. Since 2005, all babies born in San Francisco have been free of HIV. Our mission is advancing reproductive and sexual wellness for individuals, families, and communities affected by HIV in San Francisco and beyond. Our vision is a world where people affected by HIV have safe pregnancies, reproductive autonomy, access to state-of-the-art health care, and enjoyable sex lives. A little bit about Hangouts with Hive. Um, Hangouts began in November 2015 as a way to learn and share the good work of innovative advocates and providers um, with a commitment to HIV prevention. Since 2015, Hangouts has um, featured the vision and work of 60, over 70 um, champions from all over the United States. In 2018, we turned to take a closer look at the causes for HIV acquisition um, among women. And we have been thinking and talking about ways in which women may or may not engage in healthcare, um, manage competing priorities, navigate various systems, including criminal justice, social services, child welfare, and are impacted by structural racism. We hope to learn together with our panelists and viewers to shift our practice and yours to better serve women. A little bit more on today's topic. We're here to learn about more from our panelists about caring for women who exchange sex for money, goods, services, or survival. To begin with, let's acknowledge what's going on around us in the United States at this moment. Cis and trans women across the U.S. are expressing an urgent need for something different. To be heard, to be seen, to be respected. For violence, sexual or otherwise, to be addressed. From Oakland to Chicago, from Houston to Washington, D.C. Shout out to women stepping into the light for themselves and their sisters via Say Her Name, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, and others. Today we root our discussion in human rights, in labor rights, in reproductive justice and freedom. The sex industry is deeply entrenched in social inequities, structural racism, gender inequality, poverty, housing, education, migration. Some questions to think about as we move into our discussion today. What does it mean to consent? What about the sexual and reproductive labor of women? What does it mean that women exchanging sex are vulnerable to exploitation and violence and also HIV and other sexually transmitted infections? What are ways that women who exchange sex survive and thrive? What is your role in supporting these strengths? As we're listening and learning from our panelists today, let's think about our own work with women. What does it mean that many women in our communities and those who we care for in clinics, agencies, and community organizations exchange sex for money, goods, services, or survival. What more do we need to know? What do we need to do differently? And what do we need to continue doing? A couple of tips for viewers before we delve into the content of the hour. We'll broadcast for the next one hour during this time as you listen to our panelists. Please think about questions that you have for them. And you can ask them in one of two ways. One is live in the YouTube comment box. And the other is via text. That number is 415-842-2722. If you like what you're hearing or you want to weigh in in other ways, join us on Twitter. We're going to be using the hashtags Hangout with Hive and Sex Work is Work. If you missed the live broadcast, you can um, click on the link in the comments section to um, be directed to a list of resources 
um, that have to do with this hangout today. Today's discussion is going to be in question and answer form. We'll then have time to ask audience questions to our panelists. Um, and without any further ado, I'd like you to introduce. I'd like to introduce you to our panelists. Let's start with Tony Newman. Tony is the executive director of St. James Infirmary, which is a peer-based occupational health and safety clinic located in San Francisco, California offering free, compassionate, and non-judgmental health care and social services for former and current sex industry workers. Tony is also a best-selling author noted for her memoir, I Rise, The Transformation of Tony Newman. Tony, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kimberly Chang, who is a family physician at Asian Health Services in Oakland, California where she has provided care for many commercially sexually exploited children. She has trained thousands of frontline multidisciplinary professionals on healthcare's intersection with human trafficking across the United States and internationally. Her presentations and publications have focused on cultural competency, human, tra human trafficking issues, underserved populations, and global health issues. And in December of 2015, she she provided and was invited to as an expert for an expert testimony for a congressional briefing for the U.S. Helsinki Commission on Best Practices and Rescuing Trafficking Victims. Thank you, Dr. Chang. Last but certainly not least, Dr. Aisha Mays is a family physician who focuses on adolescent medicine. She is the medical director of the Roots Community Health Center Dream Youth Clinic in Oakland and faculty in the UC Berkeley UCSF Joint Medical Program. Dr. Mays provides medical care to youth who have been affected by commercial sexual exploitation and trains medical providers throughout the country on how to assess and support youth who have experienced this form of human trafficking. Dr. Mays' current research explores supporting sexual health education and agency for youth who may have been affected by commercial sexual exploitation. And with that, we'll move right into our discussion. The first question that we have is one about terms. Um, there's a lot of terms that we threw out. There's a lot of terms um, in this work to understand and respect, and we'd like to start with naming those. And so I'd like to invite Tony to really share with us some definitions, um, definitions of some terms, including sex work, prostitution, and survival sex. Tony. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tony. I'm an ex-sex worker who did survivor sex, transactional sex, and 22 years ago, I was a prostitute on the street. Uh, survivor sex, which includes you have no other job, no other means of support, and you are out there trying to just make a living to get cash for food, uh, in my case, hormones, um, uh, to go to the doctor. There was no uh, Obamacare, Affordable Care Act. So I was responsible with no job for my health insurance, my transition, and my actual living. Transactional sex would include things where you are exchanging for a place to stay, for a meal, for money, goods, and or services um, that would enable you to just live day to day. Uh, prostitution uh, as we defined it back 22 years ago, is actually when I did it, uh, was you on the street and uh, you are talking to what we call Johns for an exchange of money, uh, of services. Uh, we negotiated a fee per sex act um, in order to get what we needed in order to survive. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, Aisha, will you help us um, with definitions of um, sexual exploitation, trafficking. Also, if you have um, anything to add to any of the terms that Tony already um, shared about. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Yamini, and for bringing this, uh, this really important topic to Hive. I think it's so important for us to talk about um, transactional sex and the different types of transactional sex that happen um, throughout the world, but specifically talking about what happens in this country in the United States. Uh, and so I wanted to just, um, de define a couple of the 
a couple of the different types of transactional sex, which as um, Ms. Tony mentioned, is really this exchange of sex for something. Um, that could be money, it could be a place to stay, it could be a meal. Um, and so this sort of broad, it's a, sort of a broader, a broader umbrella, as, as she said. Um, and specifically talking about exploitation and where, where transactional sex now becomes exploitation is when there is this force, fraud, or coercion um, around it. And so I'll, I'll do the, the, the definition, the federal definition that we have from the Trafficking Victims Protection Act in 2000, which was then ratified um, four times after that, the most recent in 2013, where he, um, commercial exploitation is a part is a component of human trafficking. Um, human trafficking consists of labor trafficking and commercial sexual exploitation. Um, specifically, that means the recruitment, harboring, transportation, or provision of a person for a commercial sex act, um, where there is forced fraud or coercion. When that person is an adult, or when they're a minor. There doesn't have to be any force, fraud, or coercion. So commercial sexual exploitation of children, CSEC, which is the acronym that we use a lot, um, is this forced sexual act that doesn't have to have any force, fraud, or coercion um, connected to it. Um, and the, the things that we think about um, in terms of the, the transactional piece of this exploitation, it's not always connected to money. So it doesn't have to be for, um, for money. It could be, again, for a place to stay, uh, for a meal, um, just because someone asks you to do that. And so that's where we, when we're talking about sexual exploitation um, and sex trafficking are synonymous. So people use, there doesn't actually have to be um, movement in order for ex, uh, for it to be called sex trafficking. Trafficking doesn't have to have movement. So those things are really synonymous terms. Uh, this is Dr. Chang. Thanks, Dr. Mays. That was a great definition. I just wanted to, for the audience members and the listeners and, the, and, and people who are viewing, I wanted to make a distinction from the healthcare perspective um, and these definitions. So just remember, at least for sex trafficking, that this is a criminal justice definition is defined as a crime. So when we are seeing patients, when we are seeing patients in our clinics, in our practices, or if you're uh, in, in a behavioral health or mental health field, your clients or social services, your clients, that we are not necessarily um, looking to define someone as being sex trafficked. We're looking for the health harms and the exploitation that can cause some of these health uh, issues. So I just wanted to make that distinction, but Dr. Mays is absolutely correct in her definition uh, of sex trafficking and this exploitation here. Thank you for that. Thank you all for that. Um, next, I'd like to ask you, um, I would like to personalize this a little bit more and ask you all to reflect upon, um, one, how you came to this work. Um, I think we'd like to hear about that. And we also would really like to hear about who are the women and girls that you work with or have worked with, um, work with now or have worked with in the past? And what um, what keeps you doing this work? Um, maybe we start with Aisha. Okay. Um, so I, I came to this work um, about 10 years ago um, when I was the medical director at our local county juvenile hall. Uh, and in working with, uh, I remember actually during my interview, um, a lot of sort of chatter around um, this term teenage prostitution, teenage prostitutes, which of which that is not a real term. There's no such thing as a teenage prostitute. Um, and, I, and I had a very negative reaction to that, um, thinking that this was just another sort of negative um, term that's given for, for vulnerable youth and vulnerable girls that end up in juvenile hall. Um, and as I start to see um, young people in the medical context, just in, in terms of having a physical in juvenile hall um, and having conversations with them, and they would describe um, what seemed like a transactional, um, a, a compromised relationship, number one, <laughs> with usually an adult person, and this sort of transactional nature 
um, of their, their sexual relationships. And, um, uh, and I started to learn more about what was happening in the community through community-based organizations um, of, that are very strong in the Bay Area, um, really learning about exploitation of, of minors um, and just became very interested and also um, very curious as to why people in the medical community weren't talking about this. And um, when we know that we see young people in the medical spaces and why aren't we talking about this and why aren't we um, learning how to support young people who are being affected by exploitation. Um, I started to volunteer with an organization in Oakland called Missy um, that does direct service work with uh, female identified young people who are affected by exploitation. Um, and then I uh, I just really thought it was very important that the medical community continue to be aware and, and, um, and wanted to join the team of medical providers who are already doing this work in, in, in educating and training the community uh, and then taking a step further, about a year ago, I had an opportunity to, to open a clinic in our youth shelter in downtown Oakland. We know that homeless youth are uh, disproportionately affected by exploitation and by um, grooming for exploitation. Um, and so it's really a space where we um, provide very um, um, holistic and supportive services for young people who are active in their life of exploitation, who are in and out of the life of exploitation, as we know often happens. Uh, and so that's been a, a really um, great experience um, to be able to provide that service in the community. Thank you, Dr. Mays. I know for a fact your work is very much appreciated. Um, Tony, can you tell us a little bit about how you came to this work and what, what keeps you doing it? Sure. I, I started about 10 years ago um, at Equality California when marriage, uh, gay rights marriage was on that first ballot. Uh, it did not pass. Uh, and then I stayed on as a fundraiser and a uh, legislative aide. From that point, um, I found myself wanting more. So I got into nonprofit and health clinics, working for uh, Dr. Phillips at THE Health and Wellness, seven clinics in South LA serving minorities, Asians, Blacks, Latinos, with hair care, HIV preven prevention. And then I got hired at my tree as the development director. That's an AIDS hospice under Michael Smithwick, uh, focusing on fundraising to provide care for those that are coming at the end of their life or to help them get back on their feet. Uh, and then the St. James Infirmary came up. I've been there four months. And the reason I was interested in becoming executive director of St. James is that 22 years ago, I did transactional and survivor sex. Um, I understand it. I know the, the concept of why. So I wrote a book in 2011 to explain why would someone like me, a Wake Forest graduate, knew Maya Angelou, um, got a graduate degree, got a third graduate degree, would be working on the streets with people with no GED, people who are drug users and alcoholics. I had nowhere else to go. So I understand the concept of you have nothing and you have to do something to make money. So at St. James, I'm here because I'm concerned about trans women of color and sex workers and their rights. Um, false ancestors has come on um, and things have changed. We have the ACA now. So when Margot James found St. James in 1999, sex workers had no rallying place, no health care. So we had doctors and nurses to provide testing and healthcare. We're beyond that now, so we want to get our clinic in the 21st century and provide healthcare, but also advocacy to fight false and SESTA that's pushing young people out on the streets, men and women, girls and boys, to do things that they wouldn't know what otherwise do, but they have nowhere else to go. And, and that's why I'm here, to, to stand up for that person who's on the street and have nowhere to go. That used to be me. Tony, thank you so much. I know you telling your story and the work you do every day is very much appreciated. Thank you. Um, Dr. Chang, what about you? Hi, thank you. I'm, I'm really happy to be here, Yamini, and, and thank you for bringing together all of your, your other two esteemed guests. I, I think they're doing amazing work, and, and thank you guys for, for that. Um, I work at a community health center, a federally qualified health center in Oakland, California. It's called Asian Health Services. Uh, we started in 1974. Um, to really uh, provide services in Oakland Chinatown for community that wasn't getting any healthcare services. Uh, 
FQHCs or federally qualified health centers started out of the civil rights movement when people were agitating for civil rights and healthcare was one of them. So our, our community here in Oakland Chinatown um, got the community activists the got together with some student activists from UC Berkeley and and did a survey and they found that most of the residents weren't accessing healthcare because there were no language concordance there were there were no services in Chinatown people were just not getting care and so they started Asian Health Services so in this work in this context and with that history and that backdrop um, I got into this work uh, with uh, commercially sexually exploited children when I first started um, working at Asian Health Services 16 years ago in 2002, right after residency. And what was happening at the time was that in 2000, as Dr. Mays referenced, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act passed. That is a federal legislation defining sex trafficking. That legislation hadn't yet trickled down to the ground level. And so when I came in, we were seeing a number of youth, Southeast Asian youth and children who were being commercially sexually exploited. We looked around, saw that there were no services unless they had been arrested for prostitution or for solicitation. Um, and so Asian Health Services took that, took the initiative and started a program for a youth development program for these uh, girls, Southeast Asian predominantly uh, girls and, and young women called Bante Sre. And that's a youth development asset building organization, culturally competent, uh, culturally relevant, that's providing a lot of um, uh, services for these at risk and currently sexually exploited youth. Um, that's still going on. So my role in the clinic was, well, I'm seeing these patients, how do I support? For a long time, I didn't. I just did my doctor thing and treated infections, gave um, advice and, and saw patients for concerns. Um, until one night a patient came in who was very sick. Long story short, she was very sick, needed to go to the hospital and absolutely refused and said that she would rather uh, go to jail than go to the hospital. That didn't make sense to me, but what the reason why she said that was because on a previous hospitalization for a miscarriage, she had been discharged to jail because there was a bench warrant for her arrest for failing to show up to court on charges of solicitation. So to me, that was a very uh, uh, crucial point where I started becoming more active in advocacy and policy changes around, let's, let's really look at this in a healthcare setting from the needs of the people who are affected and what they need for getting adequate healthcare. Um, so I'll stop there. Um, that's the work that I do. That's what's, what drives me. That's what keeps it here because it's, it hasn't ended. It's still going on. Thank you so much for shedding light on that. Um, I'm actually interested in, um, furthering the conversation that you just started, Dr. Chang around criminalization. So, um, criminalization is huge for people involved in the sex industry. Um, um, by choice or otherwise, and I would love to hear from you you all about um, how women and girls you work with are impacted by law enforcement and criminalization, and how could um, decriminalization of sex work impact the women and girls that you work with, and maybe Tony, you could start that? Yeah, um, right now we have, uh, um, I guess, 10 districts in um, San Francisco area. Only the mission is arresting. Um, we're trying to work with Chief Scott, to talk about that. And the DA, uh, Jeff Gascon, has told us just recently, he will not prosecute uh, any arrest on prostitution. Uh, it's just a wasted arrest. And we're trying to work with the districts, uh, that one district now, who has the highest uh, rate of, of arrest. I I'm finding that arresting prostitutes and putting them in jail doesn't really serve any needs and has no capacity to fulfill any goals. Uh, decriminalization of, of uh, prostitution and or sex work. Um, sex work is work between two consenting adults and should be legalized for that very same reason. Arresting trans women of color for prostitution or as some states are doing for carrying a condom and assuming that they're prostitutes, it's just a waste of, of government and city funds. And I would like to see the government and the police departments really recognize that prostitution, sex work is work it is a form to make money and decriminalization would uh would keep people that don't belong in jail they're getting felonies on their records which then creates you can't get a job 
There's so many women now can't get a job for something they did 15 years ago. And San Francisco just opened a division to help you get that off your record. But that's the only city doing something of that caliber. Most people get arrested and get a felony of any kind. San Francisco is a very liberal city, but in North Carolina where I'm from, in Winston-Salem and Chapel Hill where I was educated, uh, a felony would prohibit you from getting any type of job at a university, city, clinic, or government job. So I would love to see decriminalization of sex work for the, for it's just a waste of money and time for that very reason. Thank you. Um, Dr. Chang, do you have perspectives to share on that? Well, you know, I, most of my care is among youth and, uh, and, um, and minors. And so for that reason, absolutely. I think many, many states, are now trying to follow the decriminalization of youth for because any commercial sex act in youth is basically defined as sex trafficking under federal legislation. Not all states have caught up to that legislation or have matched the federal legislation, but here in California, we do. Um, so for that reason, absolutely, I think our youth patients should not be criminalized. And in terms of adults, I don't have uh, uh, you know, enough knowledge about this to, to make a comment, but I will say that I don't think that anyone who is experiencing health issues um, should be criminalized. And, and I would go even further to, to, to look at why are there no options? Why are there no options other than, um, Ms. Ms. Tony talks about, um, she, you had no options right? You had no options to make money. And so you had to do sex work to make money. So why are there no options in our society? And how do we as a society create and increase options and decrease isolation? I think getting at decriminalization is about decreasing isolation, but we want to increase option and decrease isolation of people who are marginalized and at risk. Um, and I, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, another aspect about criminalization, which is the other policies, intersectional policies that can cause people to be more marginalized. I, I, as you know, as you heard from me, I talk about, I see patients in, a, in Asian health services, which is serving predominantly and fulfilling a need for immigrants and refugees who don't speak English. Um, there are a lot of policies that are coming down that are against immigrants receiving healthcare um, such as the public charge rule that is uh, has just been announced last week by the administration. And so, so these kinds of policies decrease options for people, decrease options for work, it decreases options for healthy environments and, and access, accessing health care or food stamps, right? So this public charge rule, uh, for, for listeners who don't know, it is an expansion of limitations for legal immigrants here in the United States from accessing things like Medicaid, Section 8 housing, food stamps. If they access that, then they, that is going to be held against them when they apply for permanent residency or citizenship. So that's decreasing options, probably increasing the probability that people will have the will, will turn towards options of um, commercial sex. Act. And we also know that there are biased, poli biased police practices in, this, you know, in the United States in general, and um, young people and certainly adults who are affected by, who adults who choose sex work and young people who are being exploited certainly are a part of those biased police practices. In um, some of my research, when talking to youth who've been affected by exploitation, they talk about this really complex um, relationship with the police and how um, most of it is this sort of demoralization that they have experienced um, by the hands of police, um, even around um, talking about their health and the fact that they sort of deserve the, the health sequelae that they may be experiencing because of the transactional nature of, of their lives. Um, and at the same time, they want, um, they want protection by the, from the police in the same way that, that uh, all citizens want to feel um, protected in the way the police were, are, were, are supposed to protect or in some theories maybe designed to protect and some theories maybe not. Maybe it's, you know, that's, that's all, that's another, that's a whole nother, um, 
hang out. <laughs> but um, I do uh, I do think that there is there is this very complex relationship. And we know that, um, that uh, girls of color, African-American girls, Latino girls are disproportionately affected um, by um, police, um, ne so these negative impacts from the police in the same way the African-Americans and Latinos in this country are disproportionately affected by um, sort of police connection and, and um, these negative effects from the police. Um, thank you all for sharing such um, such different perspectives that clearly are saying sort of the same thing. So really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to move on to asking um, the next question. And um, this next question is, what are ways in which women and girls you work with access or don't access health care? What have been some of the best practices to engage them in care? And I'm, uh, I would like to ask Dr. Mays to address that. Um, I, I really appreciate um, you asking this question because um, in healthcare spaces for everyone who's out there and taking in, in a healthcare role, um, um, whether that be a nurse, a nurse practitioner, a physician, a medical assistant, a health educator, you are seeing um, young people, you're seeing people who've been affected by sexual exploitation, and you're also seeing adults who are engaging in sex work, whether you know it or not. And so I think it's so, it's so important to be um, educated and aware um, uh, and, uh, and engaging. Uh, so I will say that the way that I have seen um, young women who I work with, and I'll say female identified young people um, accessing care, they access medical care very frequently. And studies have shown that um, time and time again, um, studies throughout the country have shown that um, we, uh, young people who have been affected by exploitation see a medical provider 50% um, to 80% of the time. We know that it, it happens. Uh, and so it's really important for us to be um, aware and sensitive. So in our clinic, we know that we see young people who are affected by exploitation and we take care of young people. I mean, we're there to take care of youth and we're not um, there to sort of put people in these silos and in these buckets that we like. Um, that help us to figure out what our differential is going to be on that on any certain day. Um, we are there to take care of young people and to um, and to really be youth led. Um, we work in a very trauma informed um, uh, environment and trauma informed practices. Um, when young people are ready to um, receive more help around their exploitation, we are there to provide that with it for them as well. Um, so again, it's it's mainly um, youth centered and patient centered. I mean, that's and I I've noticed that that seems to be at least from my perspective, it seems to be working because young people are coming back and they're telling their friends, and so that's a that's sort of the best barometer that we have. Great, thank you for really bringing it back to people centeredness at the end of the day. Um, I want to ask Tony or Dr. Chang if you have anything to add to that. Tony, you're um, on mute. I would. Um, at St. James, we're finding that sending peer base out in the community, uh, people that look like them and have an understanding of what they're doing as a sex worker. And sex work is a broad term. That doesn't include working on the street. That includes all kinds of things, uh, erotic massage, strippers, porn. I mean, it's just, uh, there's like 28 categories I've just read from some journal that would be defined as sex work. And what we're doing is trying to send peer-based a module out in the community with an outreach van. Uh, St. James is sending a nurse and outreach workers from nine to three in the morning to go with these young ladies, trans women of color, we're finding young men, we're running into young boys and girls who we work with Huckleberry and Larkin to try to get them permission so they, they can get health advice and housing. We're finding going where they are, being an active listener and sending peer-based people to meet them, to build that trust. Um, when you're that vulnerable and you've got that much trauma, you need someone you can trust. And that, that kind of relies on dependability. We go there the same time, at the same place, the same days. And we hope and pray to see these individuals come back. And then hopefully they'll come in the clinic, get therapy with our therapist, 
get case management and get housing if they want it. We don't push anything on anybody. We just trying to be there and be an active listener. And that's what I'm finding is working for St. James. Thank you. Dr. Chang, Dr. Chang. Yeah, you know, I love everything that Dr. Mays and Ms. Tony have, have said. And that's really what we have to talk about when we talk about a healthcare system and how we're reaching people who need healthcare or need healthcare access. And and one of the things in, in a federally qualified health center that we do, uh, one of the mandated things that we must have is a community board of directors. That means 51% of the board of directors of our nonprofit clinic, 501c3, must be patients of the system. That means we're absolutely required to be accountable to our community. So that's that's at the, the, the highest level. But on the ground level, you know, just like Ms. Tony said, and just like Dr. May said, um, Asian Health Services has a lot of uh, community health workers or peer, peer educators. We have programming that is not doctor centric, right? It's not about me giving a medication or prescription. It's about our team based care. How do we communicate? Do you have interpreters for at least for my patient population interpreters? Um, um, and, and people, as Ms. Tony said, who look look like them have similar experiences. So these are ways, general ways that you reach out to people who don't have access. It's not necessarily specific to people engaged in transactional sex. Um, so those, you know, I would say break down those silos, as Dr. May said, break down those silos and think about this as a healthcare issue. How do we reach out to marginalized populations, period, or populations, period, in healthcare? And so, you know, I think it's it's same. It's no different. It's no different. So a couple of things I'm hearing, and thank you so much. This is really some, these are some jewels right here. <laughs> Um, is first of all, people-centeredness, um, centering our work on the people that we are trying to serve. I heard Dr. Mays say youth led, you know, like led by folks. And I heard Tony say the same, Miss Tony say the same thing, um, kind of a for us bias peer, um, relationship, really investing in that type of work. And then I heard all three of you say, you know, not putting people in silos and doing the work consistently and and just being there and having the understanding of what's going on for patients, for people that are coming in, um, and but while not putting folks in silos. So thank you all very much for that. Um, let's talk specifically about public health messaging. So there, um, for example, pre-exposure prophylaxis is indicated as, a, as an HIV prevention method is highly indicated for women who exchange, folks who exchange sex for money, goods, survival, services, all of that. Um, but we find that public health messaging doesn't reach folks who it's intended for often. Um, so the question is really, how can women who exchange in sex um, for goods, survival, money, et cetera, be reached with messages of HIV prevention, STI prevention, public health messaging that we really need to get to folks. Um, let's have everyone weigh in on that. Who would like to start? So, Ms. Tony? I just left the National Minority AIDS Conference in Orlando. We were down there in Orlando discussing this with the uh, with the categories of black men and trans women of color leading the HIV epidemic now, San Francisco trying to get to ground zero. And uh, um, we need to do, I don't, I don't have a, a specific answer, but we need to do something more specific to men of color and trans women of color when we're doing media outreach, um, um, uh, outreach for, for them that are in the sex work industry. Uh, they were talking about doing more ads. Uh, CDC wants to do more work with doing campaigns. Um, I, I don't know uh, the, the right answer to say to really get these communities who are at now the high risk category for HIV uh, engage um, as we should, uh, besides media campaigns uh, and sending black uh, and people of color outreach workers and trans outreach workers to these communities in order to get them more engaged. 
I'll be interested to see what my other two panelists would have to say on that. I am too. Yeah, I I, um, I, I agree with Miss Tony um, in, in terms of media campaigns and really going out into the community with um, community workers. I think um, also we need to ask them first. We need to, um, I am a huge um, proponent of focus groups. <laughs> we, um, at our clinic, we do focus groups for almost any new initiative we're going to take in the clinic. We always start with a focus group with the youth and ask them, is this something they want? Number one, if they do, how do they want to this information to be brought to them? And I think um, this will be really important for um, for our community, for the communities who have been affected by exploitation and communities who engage in transactional sex in the form of sex of sex work um, to go into the communities that we're trying to connect with, communities of color, um, uh, trans trans women, African American women communities to really ask, how would you like um, this information to be relayed? Is this important? Um, if and and what's important about it? And then how how would if you were to teach this to your peer or your friend, how would you do that? And what did you think would be the best way to do to do that? Um, I think that often we have lots of savvy ideas um, which are interesting, um, but maybe not so effective. And then we we see the we see the disparities, and maybe some of that is because it whatever our intervention was. Um, was not effective because it didn't really speak to the people we're trying to connect with. So I would say that um, um, being the first thing. Um, and then um, secondly, I think whatever we um, create, always um, sort of being open and, um, um, and receptive to um, varying levels of engagement. So um, just because we have even the best campaign that came from a community, um, we also may know that there may be some stigma and there may be some, some ideas where maybe some people don't want to engage or on that day they don't want to engage. And so really being open um, and, and just there again. And as we um, always want to be in the medical community, just be there so when they're ready to, um, to make that change or, or not, just continue to provide an information education um, and also realizing that at the end of the day, um, the patients have the ultimate agency, no matter what. They were really there to be facilitators and educators, and they are the ones who decide about their health. Dr. Mays, I'd actually like to ask you a follow-up question before we go to Dr. Chang, and that is, you spoke about stigma, and this is a huge, ever-present thing in our lives, especially as cis and trans women, and of course for others as well. What does it mean that many women who engage in um, exchanging sex do not identify as women who exchange sex? And so reaching, reaching women um, who don't identify in their exchange of sex, um, how does that happen when we uh, are specifically trying to speak a certain language, to reach a certain population, but that population is not seeing itself at risk. Well, you know, that has started to make a lot of sense to me. And I, and I, I mean, I agree with what you're saying. We, that's something that we've also seen in, in our research with, um, with youth who are affected by exploitation um, and not either not seeing that they're affected or not wanting to be connected to that story for the rest of their lives. <laughs> um, and, and really having some distance from that. Um, I think that um, people feel even more stigmatized when they are just seen as one thing. And so often um, uh, it would make sense to me that there can be some, some distancing from those labels and some of that distancing may ha even have some negative health effects because we're again, we're, try, we're trying using this example of this health campaign. Um, if someone is wanting to distance because of having this stigma that's, that's happened in so many areas of their lives around that label, they may not be willing to engage around this particular thing that's healthy. So I think it's really important to just normalize people's lives that um, we're all complex being and we have beings and we have so many facets of our lives and we're not all one thing. And so really just um, engaging with people on um, uh, um, a general and holistic level of humanity so that they don't feel like they're being targeted 
again, this is a, this another targeted thing. They're not being targeted because they are they engage in sex work, or they're being targeted because someone has labeled them as exploited um, when they may not realize or understand they're they're not in that level of understanding about their exploitation. I think when we can just connect with people um, on a human level and providing information that we provide to everyone, it helps to, to break down some of that stigma. Thank you so much for that. Um, Dr. Chang, did you want to share anything? Yeah, I just I just wanted to emphasize what Dr. May said. It's, you know, as clinicians, as physicians, as care, caring, in a caring profession, we really want to treat our patients uh, from a very holistic perspective. They are people, they're human beings they're complex. Everybody has different facets of their identity. So I completely agree with uh, Dr. Mays. Um, and that would be one way to reduce the stigma. Let's just get PrEP available for everybody, right? So that's one way. Get it available for everybody who may be at risk. And if, you know, if you're having unprotected intercourse with different um, folks, you might, you're you going to be at risk, period. It's not about just giving it to sex workers. But then on the other end, um, I agree with Ms. Tony that I mean, I think they both agree with each other, but I do I do think that there should be some targeted messaging, right? And I, I'm not an expert in, in this this area at all, but but Ms. Tony mentioned um, the media, right? How do you push out these messages to the media? And I'll just give an example um, from a different set of my work. Yesterday at Asian Health Services, we did a big news conference on this public impending public charge rule I, I mentioned earlier. And at this news conference, at this press conference, we had mainstream media, but we also had targeted ethnic media. And we had interpreters available so that when they wanted to come and ask questions for us so that they could bring the message to people who don't speak English and who don't read English. So now my question then for Ms. Tony is, since I'm, I, I don't know, the ex, I'm not an expert in this, what are those media outlets or what are those, uh, you know, hangouts or social media or those web, web pages or, or those print media or broadcast media that 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 community is 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 going to and listening to so that's that's what i would say and, and focus it on it that way um yeah well if i may one thing uh was suggested at the conference is that black media black newspapers get more involved asian media asian papers get more involved latino speaking papers and news media um media of color doesn't seem to want to talk about HIV and PrEP C as much as main media will put it out. You can see an ad in, I saw one in the LA Times about PrEP. Uh, I'm at home this weekend in LA. Uh, you don't see Ebony and uh, the magazine that I read that are magazines of color, Essence, doing that type of stuff as much. And I think if we had, uh, I read Ebony, I read uh, uh, Oprah's magazine on I think if we would see more information there with people of color in the ads, like we see in HIV plus magazines with those people of color ads, I think it would help um, and, and make people more identifiable, more agreeable that that looks like me and maybe I should get tested. Maybe I should talk to a, 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 a health professional uh, like Dr. Chang and Dr. Mays. Um, it's just my opinion, just a little thought there. Great, thank you all. This conversation gets um, more multifaceted by every minute that passes. Um, the next question I'd like to ask is um, about cis and trans women. Cis and trans women are both greatly impacted by policies, practices, and violence in the sex industry. And I'd also like to just add what Dr. Mays has referred, has, has spoken to, which is female identified folks. Um, what does it look like, or what would it look like to build bridges between cis and trans women, bridges between all folks who identify as women or female? What are the possibilities and what are the challenges? Tony, would you like to start? Well, we know that trans women of color are getting murdered um, at a high rate in the United States. Um, and that murder, it goes uh, mainly unreported. Um, most of the people who are murdering them, there's less than 30% that have been found guilty, apprehended for that murder. So I think more concern about our sisters in the trans community, that when someone is killed in the trans community, we, we have more compassion, more understanding, and more rallying around them to say that we care. We're here to help you um, because trans women are, are, are 
high percentage into sex survival, transactional sex, a high percentage of uh, getting violent, uh, beaten by a lover, partner, or friend. So I, 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 for me as an activist for trans women of color specifically, I would love to see cis women uh, be more interactive with the trans women of color campaign be more concerned about the murders that are occurring in the United States. I believe they're up to over 18 or 19 um, this year. The numbers are high um, and, and we, we should get together more to show a little bit more love and compassion and concern um, in order to bridge that gap. There is a gap uh, between the cis and the trans women of color. There's a gap between black women and the black trans women of color, Asian women and Asian trans women of color. If we could get a little bit more unity around women and trans women. We're all women, different forms of woman, different definitions of women, but in fact, we're all women working for good quality health care and trying to be the best possible human we can be. Beautiful. Thank you so much for lending that voice to this. Um, any other panelists want to share on that? I just have a question. How can we do that? Do you have Do you have ways? I I wish I did. <laughs> I meet with everybody. I meet with the Black Jewish. I mean, the Jewish Association the other day. The Jewish women, the Asian Women's Association. I'm out speaking. I'm open to collaborate. I'm open to learn. I'm open to to find new ways that I, as a trans woman of color, can bridge the gap with cis women. I. I and I, I don't know how. I, I'm are not sure. National, are there national um, tr trans women organizations? You know, starting with the organizing principles. Well, there are a lot of uh, uh, legal organizations providing legal advice to trans women, but we really need an advocacy group, uh, in my opinion, uh, Together Power, where women of all facets could come together. That organization, to my knowledge, today does not exist. Um, if that organization does, I would I would love to be a part of it. If so, if you're out there, you invite me. I'll come and pay my own way. <laughs> and I, I agree. With <laughs> I agree, Miss Tony. I think also realizing that we have a lot of the same issues. Cis women of color, trans women of color. We have a lot of the same issues, particularly when it comes to reproductive health and reproductive justice, which is why Sister Song. Um, the uh, organization that is really the trailblazing organization in, reproductive, in the reproductive justice movement um, includes um, gender fluidity. It's, it's not just cis women, it's including trans women. It's really, however, um, however people identify as female are, um, are included and not just included on paper, but included in advocacy, included in, um, in the research, included in, in, um, the mar in marches. I went included to the- Included in leadership. Leadership, yep. I went to the Citrus Song Conference two years ago in New Orleans and I was like on fire. It was amazing, um, um, but to see um, trans women, cis women, however um, people identify as female, really working together uh, on this you know, unified issue around reproductive justice because we all have um, have issues around reproductive justice and me and I think it's it really powerful. Amen to that. Thank you. And I just quickly want to shout out um, a hashtag, Caroline Watson, if you're watching, um, that Hive helped to start and um, has worked collaboratively with other folks around here on its hashtag, we are all women. Please check it out. We did um, a bunch of work on that and hope to continue to do work around building bridges between cis and trans women. Um, amazing. Um, I would like to ask you all one question before we take a couple of audience question and questions, and that is, what is a take home message for the audience about what we discussed today? What is a call to action from your point of view, from where you stand, from the work that you do, given the conversation we had today, what is one take home message that you have for others who are watching? Well, if I may go first, I would like to say to people who are listening, if you see a homeless person or someone on the street, not be so judgmental. Have a little compassion. It's for the grace of God, yet I go there. So uh, my, my, my word of the day is compassion and love. Because you never know how someone got 
to that situation, why they're in that situation. And if we can all work together to eradicate uh, uh, people who are being trafficked against their will, people who are doing things against their will, um, and, and, and work on that poverty. And uh, that really is the underlying theme here. We're talking about lots of poverty and, and underprivilegedness. And I just want us to have more love and compassion. And I would say, um, I would, uh, I think I'd have maybe two take homes. I think um, number one, um, really be committed to educating yourself about um, different types of transactional sex, sex work, commercial sexual exploitation, um, and um, survival sex, different forms. Um, I think that's it's just really important to um, to understand and to have a, a lens around around um, around this work. Um, I think uh, number two would be to ask female identified people what they want <laughs> before you do something. Ask them if there is uh, a way that you that you want to engage or educate. Ask first. Ask what would be the best way. Um, and then I agree with Miss Tony with what Miss Tony said in terms of just being open and realizing that humanity comes first is before every single label and um, that we have. We're human, and and so there's if even without the education, without the knowledge about trafficking and sex work, there's humanity. So always sort of lead with humanity. Absolutely, absolutely lead with humanity. We're all human beings, we're in this together. Um, two things, two things for me. One, policies matter. So pay attention. We talk about anti-poverty, we talk about increasing options. We talk about how do we not make people more marginalized. Pay attention to the policies that are coming down and make your voice known, get involved civically. Number two, money matters. Open up your checkbook, make some donations to whoever you want, to, to Sister Song, to Roots Clinic, to uh, St. James Infirmary, to The Hive, whatever it is, money matters. That's how we do this work. Open up your pocketbooks if you can. That's, that's it. Wise words all around. Um, there is one question I'd like to ask you all, uh, whoever would like to take it. Um, can transactional sex occur within the context of a relationship? If so, how would it be differentiated from gift giving or financial support within a traditional relationship? Complicated question. I would say yes, if you're doing it because you need that place to stay. You need that breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You need something to go, a, a pass on the bus. So yes, you can be in a relationship where they demand things of you. You need those things. They know you need those things. And they use that as a way of uh, coercing you uh, to do things that you otherwise, at that given moment, wouldn't do. So that definitely happens uh, in the terms of a relationship. I completely agree with Ms. Tony, And we know that often um, young people um, when uh, sort of in this grooming process of exploitation, it is this relationship style that that can be very transactional, where they are um, they are being asked to do things for their basic needs in the same way that Miss Tony was um, just described. And so, um, I, I totally agree. Absolutely, yes. It's a that is coercion. That's a co that's a coerced thing. So even if someone is not sort of holding something over you physically, they're holding something over you in terms of materially in terms of what you need. Yes, and that can also happen with documents if somebody is brought over here. So just I'll leave it at that. I agree with everything you said. Absolutely. Thank you for adding that piece, that transnational piece, that migration piece that really people can hold over each other in a variety of ways. Um, another quick question um, came in about via text. Um, Dr. Mays, you mentioned educating ourselves, and I think everyone on this panel would agree we all need to step up our education on these topics. What are some good, if I can ask all of you, what are some good resources for folks to learn more? And of course, um, folks will receive a, um, a list of resources um, that what we mentioned here today will, in, will be included in that. Anyone want to start? 
Okay, I can I, I can lead, lend two resources. So um, one of them that Dr. Chang is uh, intimately involved with is um, Heal Trafficking. Heal Trafficking is a a nonprofit that um, of healthcare professionals, um, interdisciplinary healthcare professionals who are committed to um, to human trafficking and really learning about human trafficking and through advocacy. Um, policy, research, education. They have a very, a very vast website um, that has information about human trafficking, which includes sexual exploitation and labor trafficking. Um, and so people can learn more there um, and also join their um, several listservs to be, to have sort of continued information about that. Um, locally, um, specifically around commercial exploitation, um, for young people who've been affected by the juvenile justice system or the child welfare system, um, uh, Heat Watch, so Bay Area Heat Watch, which is um, located in Alameda County, also has an extensive um, website and infographics about young people who have been affected by exploitation who are, have been involved in the justice system and um, the child welfare system. Anyone else have resources um, to share that folks can learn more about? Tony, you're on mute. I would recommend volunteering. Uh, we need more volunteers um, to work with the youth. I know Huckleberry and Larkin are looking for youth uh, peer counselors. Uh, we're looking for volunteers to help with our programs, a good way to learn. A good way I've learned about things is to go over where they are and work with the people that I had my uh, biases on, because we all have biases. We all have our, our own biases or whatever they may be. And the only way to get rid of those is to go out and, and, and meet the folk that we may have a bias against. And we could get enlightened and educated, I think, once we get around the people that the bias that we may have may not even be a real, real true bias. Dr. Chang, anything? Yeah, some other resources I would say, you're looking at this from an intersectional lens, look at Futures Without Violence, look at the National Human Trafficking uh, Resource Center or the National Human Trafficking Training and Technical Assistance Center. Dignity Health, if you're in a hospital system, has a lot of resources around human trafficking. And Ms. Tony, I'm only speaking about um, human trafficking because that's that's the area, my area of expertise. Um, so Dignity Health, has a has a has a big um, initiative right now if you're in the healthcare sector. So those are the ones I can think of right now, just offhand. Um, and there's more. You contact Yamini, and um, and then uh, she can send out some of these links. Yeah, I'll definitely send out um, uh, all of these links. Um, I just want to share that some things that came up um, include coming first and foremost from a place of compassion and love. Um, and then secondly, educating ourselves um, and learning not just about the topics we discussed today, but the fact that policies matter, the fact that money does matter. So let's open up our pockets if we need to, or what Ms. Tony just said, which is amazing. Um, some of the best ways to learn is to go out there and do the work. Um, but there's also tons of resources to read up on and to um, like heel trafficking communities to join that are really doing this work. Um, a lot was discussed today. A lot was presented today. I want to make one acknowledgement that, that that this conversation was not an easy one to put together. Um, and that's not because um, of my panelists scheduling limitations, <laughs> although that's not an easy thing either. But this is a complicated topic um, to address and to respect all perspectives is a hard thing to do. And I really want to thank you all from the bottom of my heart for, first of all, schooling me because I didn't know um, half of what I should have known. And I know more today, although I'm on a learning journey, just like everyone else here. Um, but thank you for schooling me. Um, and thank you for letting me um, pull together this interdisciplinary conversation, because that's what this was. Folks are coming from pretty different places in the work. And we did this today. Um, and I think we, we created a, a list of things that people can do, um, and there's more to come. With that, we end today's broadcast, and we hope that you have um, an enjoyable weekend. Thank you so much. This was Hangouts with Hive.